All right. Thank you, Candice, uh, for the introduction and having me on the webinar. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all uh, from wherever you are joining. Um, I'm Dunit Danushka. I'm your host today, uh, and I welcome you all to the webinar. Uh, today, in this webinar, we are going to discuss the role of streaming data in generative AI. So we'll be looking at how streaming data and generative AI can play nicely together, um, how they complement each other, and, and most importantly, as developers and architects, how we can extract the best out of both uh, streaming data and generative AI to build more improved and better real-time uh, real data applications. Uh, a little bit about myself, uh, Candice has already introduced me. Uh, so I'm Dhanit Danushka, Senior Developer Advocate from Red Panda. For those who are uh, new to Red Panda, it's a streaming data platform, API compatible with Apache Kafka. Uh, that means if you already have a, a producer or a consumer that is working with Kafka, you can seamlessly work with Red Panda. So we'll talk about Red Panda at the later section. Um, I'm a solutions architect and developer advocate. Uh, who's having the uh, background in big data, stream processing, and uh, large-scale event-driven architectures. Uh, so my day job as a developer advocate at Red Panda means uh, helping you, uh, developers like you and me, to learn uh, and uh, adapt Red Panda to build a scalable and faster real-time data application. Uh, if you are interested, you can follow my work on Twitter, Medium, and LinkedIn. Uh, and if you already have, if you have any questions after this webinar, you can reach out to me uh, and say hi in any of these channels. All right, let's get started. And you can check uh, these links posted in the chat uh, for this thing. All right, what are we going to discuss today? You know this. Generative AI has been a, a decade-old technology, and it has been evolving over the couple of years, and specifically in the last year, uh, it went viral, and it exploded. Uh, you know, the, these interesting projects like uh, OpenAI, Chat, uh, Chat GPT, DALI, MidJourney, uh, Hugging Face, and you name it. And they, all these projects, they have taken the concept of generative AI to the masses, like uh, people like uh, you and me. So, uh, and then uh, everyone, including developers, uh, decision makers, businesses, they started going uh, after this uh, concept of generative AI, hoping that uh, that will help their uh, businesses to perform well and better. So I, I, I can recall this momentum uh, much similar to the uh, situation we had a decade ago uh, when the big data uh, thing came into the picture. So everyone believed that uh, uh, big data is going to solve every our problems. So let's see uh, whether it is true with generative AI or not. Having said that, uh, goal of today's webinar is to understand generative AI uh, for some extent, and then uh, see what are, what are its, the opportunities that we can use our business data as enterprises uh, to work with generative AI and uh, extract meaningful insights from generative AI to build a better application uh, and leveraging streaming da data in the process. So that's the plan for today. And then uh, just to structure our session, I came up with this agenda. So first, I'll give you a brief introduction to generative AI. Uh, uh, if you are a complete beginner to generative AI, don't worry, I'll cover the foundations. Uh, so I'll give you the basic foundations of generative AI. And then we'll talk about the million dollar question today. Uh, that is how you can use your business data with generative AI. So there are several challenges and we'll go, go through each of every, each one and then we can measure their impact. And then we'll gradually bring in uh, streaming data, uh, how we can use streaming data to uh, with uh, generative AI in combination. So we'll be talking about a couple of 
prompt engineering techniques and uh, fine tuning techniques and whatnot. And then finally, we can uh, talk about some real time use cases that are already being powered by generative AI and, and also some use cases that has the potential to uh, get benefits from streaming data. And then finally, we, uh, we can take a couple of questions uh, and from the audience and uh, then we can wrap up. So that's the plan for today. Uh, we can continue. First, let's discuss what is generative AI? What does it mean? So uh, what generative AI is a subfield or a subdomain in the artificial intelligence, which has the ability to generate new content based on the user input. So the easiest way to understand this is to use with the visual uh, representation. So let's focus on uh, this box in the middle in, the, in this diagram. So in, here we have this black box uh, saying generative model. So in the heart of generative AI, we have uh, machine learning models. So that is represented by this generative model. And this model has connected to this brain and this brain represents the data set or the cognition that this model has been trained on. So there are so many ways you can train, build and train machine learning models. I'm not going to give you a, a deeper, uh, deep dive into this, uh, the specifics first, right? And then we as humans and users, we use input data towards this uh, um, generative AI model. As, as in, uh, we as a human, we interact with these models through a natural language interface or NLP interface. And sometimes, uh, most of the time, this uh, interface is called a prompt. And we instruct this uh, model to perform something or generate something new by giving a prompt, right? So this prompt is written in natural language, like in plain English or uh, could be uh, Italian or uh, Spanish, doesn't matter. And once the model receives this input, it can synthesize its the output uh, based on the uh, patterns and examples it has learned from this training data set or from its wisdom. And then it generates uh, the output uh, containing uh, some sort of a text, textual answer, an image, a piece of music, uh, vi videos, and so on. So there are so many ways we can do uh, these uh, uh, outputs we can do. And then when it comes to the commercialization and marketing, so mainstream media outlets, internet and social media platforms have made us believe that generative AI is all about chat GPT and a few other tools, but it is wrong. Generative AI is more about these tools and it goes beyond that. It is something like when we talk about uh, electric cars in general, uh, Tesla does not represent all the electric cars. So there are so many other electric variants coming from uh, vehicle manufacturers like BMW, Mercedes, Ford, and they all have their uh, electrical variants. So like it is very similar to this domain. So like I said, uh, if we have a broad, broader look at the generative AI composition, uh, the foundational layers, we can identify a purposefully designed uh, couple of machine learning models. The one I mentioned, the chat GPT in the earlier slide, so it belongs to this transformer model. So it can transform uh, the user's input into something new. So basically it evolves from this LSTM and LLM, uh, so large language model. I'll be sprinkling this term uh, throughout the presentation. So just keep that in mind, large language model or LLM for short. Um, so they, right now we have uh, models like uh, Da Vinci, the GPT-3, GPT-4 kind of things. And then apart from that, we have a few other uh, models like uh, RNNs, GANNs, and so on. I don't want to scare you by uh, uh, sprinkling this jargon into the presentation. So, but just keep that in mind when you 
uh, when you're dealing with generative AI, we will be working with this kind of models in particular. And then we go to the, uh, the business side of it. We can, I, we can see a vibrant, diverse, and fast-growing ecosystem of uh, generative AI companies. Uh, when you're reading <coughs> news or uh, browsing the internet, you might have seen a couple of funding announcements for generative AI uh, startups like AI-based something. Uh, so, so there are so many ways uh, AI can help uh, this ecosystem. So for example, we have uh, AI-based startup or technologies that helps you write better, uh, especially for marketing people. Uh, they can uh, summarize some text and they can generate some copies for websites and they can summarize an email. Uh, so it, they can add a tone or color to it, uh, a bland text or paragraph so that it can sounds more interesting or appealing. So that's one example. And then for images, we have this uh, DALI. So they can generate images, different images based on the user's specification. You can write a natural language expression to generate an image. And then we have coding assistants like GitHub Copilot that uh, generates code, actual code, ex executable code based on the user's prompt. And then so many things we can see, uh, text summarizers, uh, uh, ex uh, some, some tools can extract uh, the the transcript of a YouTube video and uh, put it into a good use. So, I mean, they have been there for, a, for, quite, for quite some time. So, and it's expected to grow uh, in the next couple of years as well. Now uh, that we understand the basics of generative AI, uh, now we have the million dollar question here, it could be the billion dollar. That is, how can we use my business data with generative AI models or large language models. That means how uh, they, how can I get the help from a generative AI model to analyze my business data and come up with something new? Uh, <coughs> sorry. Before that, um, let me talk about some limitations or the generic nature of these uh, large language models. So I, I'm speaking particularly about large, large language models, so LLMs. Um, let me take some, drink some. Right, so when you when you browse the internet, you can see all, uh, the OpenAI chat GPT-3 or chat GPT-4 based interface, and then Google came up with this Google Bard, and then Microsoft came up with this uh, uh, Bing, and then we have Hugging Face and all these uh, public models available there. Uh, the common thing for both uh, of all of these models is that they have been trained uh, using uh, data available on public internet. Uh, that means they have been they are pre-trained. Uh, the GP in the letters of GPT. Uh, it says a gen generative uh, pre-trained transformer model. That means it's you can buy this model off the shelf from uh, this particular company and you can use it uh, from the day one. That means there's nothing to do with uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, engineering side. You can just use it uh, off the shelf. So that's the beauty of it. And that beauty also comes with some limitation. That is, uh, there are some bias towards some answers uh, because the model has been trained on public internet. Uh, there can be some bias towards certain answers. So, for example, if you ask a question, the answer could be biased towards something. And also, the most important thing is uh, ChatGPT doesn't know about your organization's data. Uh, for example, if you are an architect or a decision maker from your organization, you cannot ask, uh, the chat GPT, uh, tell me whether John Smith is going to buy this item or not. Is my, and also, uh, can you generate an email to my customer? Uh, something like, something specific to your personal uh, business data. That is because chat GPT or this LLM has no context on your business data. So that's the 
limitation or the concern that we are trying to find an answer today. So what are the ways we can answer this question, uh, problem? Uh, so there are so many options. So let me highlight the best. <laughs> the first comes building your own generative AI model. Uh, it's like a boiling the ocean approach. Uh, probably not the best idea. Uh, let me tell you why. Um, this building your own LLM uh, or large language model or generative AI model, uh, it's like a <clears throat> so, uh, it takes a lot of effort and time because uh, in order to train this data, you need a large uh, data set. And uh, this, is, this is usually called the corpus. And then uh, building it also requires some uh, skill sets, especially in data scientists and, and statisticians and uh, rare to find uh, skills. And also, even if you build the data, uh, build the model, it will take uh, more uh, computationally expensive operations to do the training. And you might need more large clusters and the training will run for a couple of days or even weeks uh, based on the configuration. And it might give you a staggering bill of uh, cloud. Uh, so that th And uh, those are the concerns why you should not build your own uh, large language model or LLM. I mean, if you can do it, it's good, but for majority of, of people, it's going to be a, a problem or a challenging. So, uh, and then that gives us the more practical approach. Uh, so, what would be the best approach to deal with that if you are not building uh, a large language model for your organization? Uh, so, next best alternative is buy one of these base models or so foundational models from uh, internet. So, you can take ChatGPT, uh, Google Bard, or whatever and then fine tune it to uh, inject your enterprise data. Uh, that's one other approach. And this, this is called, uh, specifically called fine tuning. And uh, it's the process that uh, further uh, taking a pre-existing language model and, uh, uh, and training it on specific data. So this, in, this is again, it's a complicated process, and this requires you to have uh, broader skills on data science, machine learning, and uh, data engineering as well, because you're going to dissect the model and uh, freeze several layers in, uh, of the, and then uh, do the training. So it's uh, I'm not that familiar with this domain as well. It seems like it's a, uh, a operation that really needs uh, good expertise on machine learning. And the most, uh, uh, the, the disadvantage is, uh, you know, that in businesses, the data is generated continuously. And even if you <coughs> fine tune this uh, model today, there's a possibility of uh, out this training data set getting outdated as soon as possible when new data comes in. And that's the uh, biggest disadvantage in this fine tuning. And that leads us to find a more com uh, less complicated and uh, also cost-effective approach of uh, using uh, LLMs. And that is where we come to a prompt engineering. Uh, so what is prompt engineering? So I keep dropping jargons. So let me bust these jargons. So let me get back to uh, the initial definition. So. As you, as you remember the diagram I showed you, uh, so we as a human, we use a prompt to uh, deal with the, uh, or communicate with the large language model. So this prompt uh, could be in a, a form of a question, like a conversational style, or it could be a command, like, a, like I'm instructing or commanding the model to generate something. Or it could be in a question, like uh, asking a question, uh, uh, just for learning purpose. And then based on its training data set, LLM can synthesize the answer and respond back. Now, uh, we are going to 
a look at a less complicated uh, prompt uh, engineering thing. That means, can we engineer the prompt to contain uh, my personal data? Because we all know that the, the LLM has no access or has no aware, awareness of the, your personal data. So this is where we use this concept of prompt engineering. So in prompt engineering, the description of task is embedded in the user input uh, instead of being explicitly given. So it's like uh, uh, asking uh, the LLM about a specific user, a specific customer in your business, you do it beforehand. And before, uh, before sending the prompt to the uh, model, you can prepend, you can build the user context uh, uh, beforehand by uh, reading your customer data and stating them as facts. And we can call, we call it a uh, context. So basically we have our data here and what we do is we build a prompt. It's like a pre, pre prepending your prompt with your business. Let me give you an example. So let's say uh, we need to notify uh, customers about a potential uh, flight delay. Uh, say for example, this particular flight has been delayed and we need to generate uh, a good uh, or personalized notification for each customer that will be, uh, that would be uh, affected by this particular delay. So, when we do that, we can build the context uh, beforehand like this. So this is the context, as you can see, I'm stating the facts. Okay, this flight number is this, uh, departure time is this, uh, and, and these are like, pub, uh, these are specific to your business. Just keep that in mind. Uh, this is specific to your business. And then uh, I can give the instruction to the model. So you can think of this like a, a two-tier approach. First, you do the context, you build the context, and then you instruct. So basically, this, this instruction is like a processing command, processing logic. Like you like write code, you can instruct. Um, so I'm instructing the model uh, saying my customer's flight has been delayed, uh, and then digest this information and generate a message to each customer, uh, blah, 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 blah. So that's the approach we are going to look today. Right. And then uh, once we do that, the model can, uh, let me go back. Once we, so when you pass this whole thing, the prompt, the prompt see, everything in one place. And based on this information, model can synthesize its output. And it will be a lot faster because uh, the amount of information that model has to process is low and everything is contained in a single uh, uh, prompt. Or, uh, so how do we provide this context? So what are the mechanics here? Uh, so there are several ways. Uh, so the easiest way is um, when a user types a question, we can do that on demand. That means when when user asks a question, let's say uh, let's say you are a customer for a uh, airline company, and the airline company provides you with a, a chat bot or chat agent, and then you can ask, you can log in, and you can uh, type this question: uh, Can I? get an extra bag luggage for this particular flight. And then what would happen next is, on your behalf, this chat application uh, will query a database or something like, uh, let's say, for example, let's say a database, a generic database, and it can fetch your personal details, uh, like your age, your uh, tier miles, your loyalty points and everything. And then it can build this context for you. And on behalf of you, this context will get prepended to your, uh, your prompt. And like I said uh, in, the big, uh, in the before slide, uh, there will be two tiers, uh, the context and your prompt, and the whole thing will get passed to the uh, 
open AI model. Uh, so there are some things that uh, uh, some need things you need tweaking. For example, uh, one thing that uh, large language model does not have is a long term memory. That means they have a limitation when it comes to the amount of tokens that you can pass. Tokens in the same could be characters. Uh, uh, so, uh, so this token has a limitation. For example, GPT-4, as I remember, has a limitation of uh, 8,000 tokens per one uh, session. Uh, some, someone can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, for that, we can use a vector database. Uh, so that's for long-term memory. Uh, but you don't need a vector database all of the time uh, because now the vector database has become a trend again as well. Uh, uh, another distinction is uh, if you know everything about your customer exactly, uh, I mean, if you have keyed in your customer every transaction, for example, for a customer, we have uh, uh, loyalty points, past transaction, everything in easily searchable manner, right? And we know. Uh, exactly what we are looking for, and then go for it. Uh, we can use a uh, fast, faster database. And then uh, if we have something uh, we uh, we don't we don't exactly know about customer. For example, uh, something like uh, uh, policy, like a baggage policy or something. So this could be in a vector database uh, because uh, the policy document and everything will be very large in size and uh, it is impractic impractical to uh, prepare the whole thing into a single prompt because it will eat up your token uh, bandwidth as well. So the point here is you don't have to use both and depending on the circumstances, uh, you can choose either a, a database or a vector database. This is still a debating thing, uh, we'll see. And then uh, what are the challenges of this approach? Uh, so this is, we call it context injection. Uh, the most challenging thing is to keep fr data fresh and relevant. That means uh, the data, the context we are injecting to a prompt should be fresh and they should be rele still relevant. That means we should not uh, use uh, data that is older than, uh, uh, maybe to the to this moment. I mean, a uh, batch driven approach doesn't uh, work here. And the data retrieval must be fast. Uh, that means when the user types in the prompt and the mechanism should be uh, very faster to respond uh, with the customer data. So we can look at the whole big picture in a couple of, uh, in the later slide. So those are the two requirements, the freshness of data and the, uh, retrieval or the uh, read performance. So having that in mind, how are we going to find a solution here? So, and that prompts us to uh, have data in motion. And uh, it means data must be dynamic and it must be fast. And then uh, that gives, that leads us to use streaming data uh, in our uh, solution and this is where we uh, this is the critical part of our presentation and before that before we pro uh, proceed further we have a poll question coming in so you can all uh, it might take a couple of seconds to answer this question it's a no-brainer uh, so let us just answer this question uh, let, let's uh, just give some time Can see some answers coming in. All right, all right. Uh, let's close the poll and let's uh, move on. All right. So let me introduce what is streaming data. I'm pretty sure you are already familiar with that, but uh, for net new or uh, users or audience, uh, let me define. So stream st streaming data. 
is composed of streams of data. That means a stream is a continuous, never ending flow of data with no beginning or an end. That means it is unbounded. Um, and, and the data is incrementally made available over time. And uh, you, it enables you to act upon this data without downloading it first. So the best example to uh, understand streaming data is to compare it with a video streaming solution or something like Netflix. When you, when you are watching a video on Netflix, you just keep uh, press, you just press the play button and you just watch it, right? You don't have to download it. The, the video will be rendered as the new data comes in. So the same applies for streaming data. So only difference is the transport protocol we are using. In, in streaming, uh, in video, we have RTSP, but in streaming data, we have different uh, protocols, formats, and things like that. And if we zoom into a stream of data, we can identify events. Uh, event is the, uh, the the foundational log uh, building block in a stream. So event, uh, a data stream consists of series of data points ordered in time. Uh, and these, each data point represents uh, a state change occurred in the uh, source system. Source this system means uh, that the place where the data is coming from, the origin of data. And uh, as you see, the diagram, you can see the event source is producing events, and then uh, these events are coming as a string, and you can see uh, the first event has the uh, oldest timestamp, the, the time where the event has happened, and then it goes through a different system. And this this is connected to this whole event-driven architecture and publish sub subscribe systems, where uh, publishers produce events and sub subscribers who are interested in getting to know about these state changes, they subscribe to these uh, event streams. And then in the middle, we have this event bus for the streaming data platform uh, in practical, uh, acting as a, a conduit between event producers and consumers. Now, uh, let's see how we can leverage this streaming data to uh, inject uh, the customer context into a large language model. That's the million dollar question here. Um, so we can come up to this uh, high level architecture here. Uh, so everything starts from here, from the left side, as you can see. Uh, so this is all a continuous operation. This is not a synchronous one. So I'll explain the difference. So we have corporate data assets here. Uh, your corporate databases, uh, file systems, legacy applications, mobile devices, and everything. So they keep pumping out events. They keep producing events. And then in the middle, we have a uh, streaming data platform like Red Panda, right? So this, this is your customer uh, data. And then we can uh, use a different layer. The third layer is a stream processor, or it could be a streaming database, something like uh, materialized, rising wave, flink. So there are so many choices you can choose from. So what they do is they ingest this customer data coming from Red Panda in real time, and they can build materialized views. That means uh, we can call it a customer 360 view. Um, that's the standard term when, when we deal with these data warehouses and uh, other analytical applications. So basically, you can define a view with uh, a primary key with a custom ID and then uh, the, the past transaction that he has performed or the loyalty points or something like that. And then the important thing here is this material layers view keeps getting up to date then in real time. It's not stale. It doesn't stay stale. So it keeps updating. How? For example, let's say if the customer changes his address, we can use a change data capture mechanism like Debisium to stream that change into Red Panda. And then in a few seconds, that change will reflect in the underlying materialized view. So that's the true beauty here. 
And it, this will make sure that the data we, the customer data we maintain here is always up to date and it is uh, uh, easier to access. And then we have this workflow in the right hand side. So this is where in the, in the middle we have this application where this is, you can build this application. So it could be anything, it could be a support agent uh, uh, exposed to your customers, or it could be internal application, something like a help desk or something like a, a, a console where you, it is only exposed to your employees just to ask questions about your personal data or business data. And then we have this user uh, asking a original question. For example, let's say this is a support bot and uh, the, a customer is asking question, am I eligible for a, uh, ex extra luggage or are you going to charge for me? Then secondly, uh, application receives the prompt and it does this uh, context injection. So what, what it does is it queries this customer data. So because at the moment this user logs into this application, we can capture his customer ID and pass it to our materialized view. And we can query the custom ID against the materialized view and get his complete picture based on the context. And then uh, that context will be uh, prepended to the prompt, original prompt. And then uh, we can call it enrichment. And then we can pass it to the uh, uh, language model, which is uh, in the internet. So this is a pre-trained model. Uh, so this could be uh, OpenAI, ChatGPT, uh, GPT-3 or GPT-4 varieties, and then we have Hugging Face, uh, and then major cloud vendors, they have their own uh, 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 implementations as well. Uh, so here uh, you can use APIs, their APIs to uh, integrate with their application, but if you use a, a framework like uh, Langchain or uh, Llama, or, and there are so many things coming up, uh, but uh, Langchain could be the best option here. So it, it can abstract these uh, models for you so that you can uh, uh, focus on uh, in just for the integration. And then uh, the model will do the synthesizing and it will answer, and the answer can flow down uh, to the uh, user level. So that's a very similar schematic, schematic of a, uh, how streaming data and large language models work in unison to uh, fulfill a user request. Yes, and I have a question. Uh, how do you get a customer ID from an app? Yes, a good question. Uh, usually, uh, it, it's up to you. So basically, if you are designing a mobile application or support bot, you can capture it upon the login. Or it's there are so many ways. And like I said, if if that is an internal application, you can capture the uh, employee ID. Or and if it's an if it is an uh, internal application that it is more easy, then you can ask the employee to enter the custom ID. So there are a couple of options here. Right, now what is the role of Red Panda here? So as you can see uh, the, here, we have Red Panda acting as the buffer or the conduit of ingesting all this data and passing it to the uh, processing layer or stream processing layer. So for those who are new to Red Panda, like I mentioned, it's a streaming data platform API compatible with Apache Kafka. And uh, that means uh, if you already have Kafka producers and consumers, you can seamlessly integrate them with Kafka or Red Panda. Since Red Panda speaks the uh, Kafka language, uh, so that, that makes this seamless integration possible. But at the same time, Red Panda has some architectural differences, significant differences uh, that makes us different from Kafka in terms of uh, scalability. A simplicity in operations and uh, cost effectiveness in, uh, when you operate them in production. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're interested in finding out more, you can uh, go to redpanda.com and check out the website and the uh, uh, 
a documentation and associated YouTube channel as well. And make sure to uh, check out the chat for more links. And there's a question uh, from uh, Rudraksha. Does Red Panda provide any free tier to using persons project as a student? Uh, yes, so you can, we have the cloud option, Red Panda Cloud. Uh, so you can register for an account and you can uh, uh, spin up a Red Panda cluster and uh, you can give it a try. Uh, and that's, that's the easiest option, but uh, if you are interested in uh, just trying it out, you can use these Docker images and we have Kubernetes Helm charts. You can try out them as well. All right. Okay, so what are the benefits uh, of this approach? Uh, streaming data and generative AI. Uh, the, the biggest benefit is the streaming engine ensures that business data is always fresh and relevant. And, and we will make sure that you are not, uh, the model is not dealing with a data, customer data item that is uh, older than the, the current day. And also uh, the underlying mechanism like uh, materialized databases and uh, vector data. So they will provide fast access to data. That means when, whenever the prompt we do the context ingestion, uh, these databases have been uh, designed to provide more uh, uh, fast access to customer information. And this whole thing, I mean, uh, streaming data and generative AI unlocks many uh, use cases and business potentials. Uh, for example, uh, this will enable advanced data analysis within organization. For example, you have a pile of organizational data uh, that have been uh, collected for several years, and you have this obsolete data warehousing tools and BI tools. Uh, uh, but if you integrate this approach, like streaming data and uh, uh, LLMs, you, you can ask LLM to uh, solve some different questions, uh, problems for you. For example, uh, a department head is asking LLM, is, is my department going to meet these quarter goals? Am I, uh, see, probably CEO must be asking, is my business profiting? Uh, and uh, is it going to loss? Uh, what's the projection? So those kind of things. You, uh, these non-technical, even non-technical users use natural, uh, natural language to ask their question and interact with it uh, as if they are talking to a real human. So that's one use case. Uh, second one is AI-assisted marketing. Uh, that means uh, this uh, LLM can be uh, used to generate cold emails uh, uh, based on the uh, past customer interactions. Uh, and then also we can offer hyper personalized user experience to uh, users, especially for digital customers and based on the real time in, uh, interaction with the uh, business. For example, if a train is getting delayed, uh, we can ask an LLM uh, to uh, generate a personalized re uh, recommendation for next best action. For example, should I uh, book a hotel as a passenger or uh, uh, should I take the next one, next available train, or should I cancel my plans? Something like that. And those things will drive more loyalty, engagement, and uh, sales ultimately to the businesses. And then if we go beyond the typical LLMs and if we uh, consider the other model variants here, like GANs, uh, autoencoders, and RNNs, there are a few other use cases. For example, we have this data augmentation or imputation possible. For example, when you are processing data from IoT devices or uh, time series processing, there can be missing data points in a uh, lot of uh, situation because of the uh, unreliability of the network and there can be few gaps. And in such cases, we can use a model to generate the uh, missing pieces and we can do some uh, calculation to smoothen the uh, calculation. So this is a typical flow. Uh, so this is not exactly real time, but uh, this could be some near real time use case. So for example, this is here, the MQTT data coming in and then uh, streams of the like link can 
be doing the stream processing and the inferencing, model inferencing and imputation can happen in this flow. So at, at the end, we have the complete data with full fidelity. And then potential another use case would be a dynamic generation of gaming content, uh, depends on, uh, depending on the user's interaction. For example, if you love uh, McDonald's or KFC and, and then uh, if you uh, play a game, probably at the mid game, you might see uh, uh, a billboard of uh, uh, McDonald's <laughs> in the middle of the game. So because it is generated automatically based on your customer uh, past interaction with that business. And there are so many possibilities. And this is widely used in practice. Uh, probably if you are using Grammarly, uh, it's a writing assistance. It can suggest a better way of writing uh, as you are typing. Like for example, once you are doing writing a paragraph, you can summarize it or it can add a different tone or a color to what you are writing to sound it more better. All right, I think we are at the top of the hour. Um, we can summarize what we have discussed so far. Uh, you know, generative AI has been there for, for some time around. And uh, the biggest challenge here is how you can use your business data with the model, AI generative AI model, to make your business better. Um, and then there are so, so many ways we discussed. Some has challenges like uh, building your own uh, LLM is not an option and fine tuning is quite complicated and the best and uh, the cost efficient and easily understandable approach would be to use a context injection with some a mix of a prompt engineering. And there we can utilize streaming data to make, uh, to ensure that the customer data is always moving and it's dynamic and available whenever it's needed. And then we discuss a couple of use cases where we uh, can use uh, real-time gener uh, uh, generative AI in the betterment of streaming data. And that's all I wanted to share with you today. And thanks for joining and listening. Um, I can take a couple of questions uh, right now. I can check. Manju is asking how many servers are required for a mid-sized company. Uh, I, I presume this is about Red Panda. So I can answer in context of Red Panda. So if you are starting out from Red Panda, you can just start with the Red, just one node. Or if you are going with a containerized deployment, just one container, uh, you, just to play around with that. But when you are scaling it out to production, we recommend uh, at least three. Uh, three uh, Red Panda servers to, just to keep the core, uh, you know, uh, the quorum uh, and to make it fault tolerant uh, during a deployment. So there are so many uh, deployment patterns to uh, consider when you scale out to production. Go and check out Red Panda documentation for a more detailed answer. But uh, in uh, summary, you can just start with a single one. Okay, I don't see no no further questions. So thank you all and allow me to hand it back to uh, Linux Foundation. Uh, Candice, over to you. Thank you so much, Dimith, for your time today. And thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you have a wonderful day and that you join us for future webinars. Thanks so much.